amongst all the chaos, amongst all the confusion, the changes, the adjustments, the be this, the be that, is to say at the end of this, regardless of what you thought, I'm going to overcome this. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Out of Character with me, Ryan Satin. I hope you all enjoyed last week's episode with Jeff Hardy as much as I did. I'm still mad about kickwear and the raver pants. I've been thinking about it for an entire week now, but I got to move on because I got another guest on this week's show, someone I'm very excited to chat with. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Out of Character, Keith Bearcat Lee. Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Greetings and salutations. How are you? Good, sir. I am doing fantastic. It's finally cold in LA for once, so it's nice to be able to wear a sweatshirt for the first time in like two years, it feels like. Yeah, it was a little chilly when I was there. I was uh, really enjoying the weather, not so humid like it is in Florida. <laughs> yeah, definitely much better in California than Florida. All right, I'm going to start off my first question here. It's what I ask everyone at the top of each week's show. How much of your real true self is there in the character you play on TV? It depends on which character you're talking about. Um, previously, if you're referring to anything times in NXT or when I first came up to the main roster, I would say that uh, there wasn't really a character. It was just me being me and you know having fun, enjoying myself. So I would say that was just me turned up to a certain level that was above average. Um, I would say that Bearcat has some relevance to who I am, but in a more uh, competitive level, almost uh, football related, if you will. Um, just a guy that wants to get business done. But Bearcat is a guy that just walks out there already ready to decimate whomever is in the ring. So. Um, it's a real interesting switch for sure. Is this something that Vince has been kind of hands-on with? Because I remember in your WWE 24, after your Raw debut, there's that scene where they show him talking to you and he says something along the lines of like, we're gonna try and make some changes. We might need to make some changes to you in order to help you, um, in order for a global audience to relate more directly to you. So has he been kind of hands-on and helpful with this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say that uh, he's been quite hands-on. And that's honestly something that I need because I want to know what he wants as opposed to making a guess or some sort of uh, estimation or hypothesis or whatever the case may be. If I know what he wants directly, then it makes it that much easier to give him what he's looking for. And so if he, you know, he's the man, if, if he runs this and he wants a specific thing out of one of his talent, then the job is to give him what he wants, so. I reached out to Mia Yim before doing this interview with you to get some fun facts to of things that we could discuss. And uh, I was like, hey, we want <laughs> some fun, you know, cause I was Googling like, you know, you know, there's those articles you'll see like fun facts about so-and-so, but they're always like facts everybody already knows. So I was like, maybe I'll go to, I'll go right to the source. <laughs> I'll go to the significant other and see if there's anything that, that she can add on top of it. And one of the things that she told me that I liked was that um, that you're a huge World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy fan. Uh, yes, I play World of Warcraft far less these days, but Final Fantasy XIV is something that uh, if I'm, I, I'm really not paying attention right now, but it's probably up in my background somewhere right now. Um, who knows? But yeah, I, when I have time, I, I try to get that in if I can. It's a nice little relaxation for me. What is it about those games that has always uh, attracted you so much to them? What's that? What is it about those games that you've always liked so much that attracted you to them so much? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> let's take it back. So uh, years ago, I met uh, someone that I've known for a very long time. I'm talking like since I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, his name is Lascelles King. Uh, he's still a very, very close friend of mine. Um, <clears throat> and he introduced me to RPGs, role-playing games, um, starting with Final Fantasy IX. And 
if it were never for him, I never would have learned about those types of games or anime or any of, the, of that sort. That time of my life, I was just pure jock. Basically, everything that Bearcat is, that's who I was back then. But he kind of got me in touch with this other side of me, which kind of resonated with the, the, the big guy that likes music and reading and things of that sort. And um, ever since then, I've just always played some sort of RPG game and MMOs kind of match that uh, growing stronger. Also, how I feel in life, like I just want to be better than the day before. So a lot of that coincides with how I am in life and, and what I feel about whether it be lifting weights or reading books or some sort of thing that I want to learn about. Uh, it just all fits and melts together. Uh, is Final Fantasy like World of Warcraft? Because I'm so I'm actually terrible with RPGs. That I I've never I've I've never gotten into them. Not that I dislike them. I've just never gotten into them. Is Final Fantasy like World of Warcraft, where you have like one character that you can continually expand, or is it different? Uh, so actually, that's more true for Final Fantasy. As okay. you have a character, and and as you change weapons, so too does your style of fighting change. Okay. Um, whereas in World of Warcraft, you have to create multiple characters to have a bunch of different alternate options. So it's a more true for Final Fantasy and uh, a little more in-depth than, than what World of Warcraft offers, I think, personally, uh, especially story-wise. So that's, as a guy that likes reading books and things of that sort, I really appreciate the story aspect of it. Yeah, I... I uh... I liked, I remember Fable. I liked Fable, which was the only like real RPG game that I liked. Cause it was cool that like your decisions changed your character. I, I always liked that where you could become more evil. It was like a Grand Theft Auto meets, uh, you know, a more, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More of like a mystical type world, which I, I always appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. It's like fantasy, uh, fantasy GTA. Why not? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Wait, so then. <laughs> Okay, so wait, if Final Fantasy is where you have a character that you grow, what's your character like on there? Is, the, is it something that you've created that's specific to you? Uh, yeah. Um, currently, um, I obviously, I, I've been leveling different classes and things of that sort, but uh, I, I'm way into, like, the, the gathering and profession crafting stuff right now because, really, the world is just waiting on this expansion that's coming out in November which obviously <laughs> I won't have the kind of time that other people have for it, but I'm going to, I'm going to get in there and do what I can. Um, my current character's main thing is uh, he's like, she shoots a bow and arrow and plays music and things of that sort, which is also sort of fitting for me uh, as music is a very enormous joy in my life. And a lot of people can tell, in the music that I've created, whether it be my music from NXT or uh, the most recent music that I made from the main roster, uh, that's something I enjoy greatly. So it's a lot of fun. Are you fairly eclectic as a music guy or do you have one genre that you stick with? Very eclectic. I listen to literally everything. Uh, matter of fact, old friends of mine, <clears throat> such as uh, Eric from the Viking Raiders, <clears throat> And a buddy of mine named Shane Taylor had a plethora of stories about complaining about the the varied styles of music that is on my playlist. Which one do they complain about the most? Um, <clears throat> it's either uh, my random Japanese music or, or anime type songs or the uh, occasional Britney Spears or Miley Cyrus song that shows up. I see. I can handle those last two, the Britney and the Miley. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board with. I don't, I don't know if I was in a long car ride, if I could handle anime music either. I feel like that would, uh, that might be the line for me. And I'm fairly eclectic too. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, everybody's different, but those guys like specific types of music for the most part. And I just. I don't know, man. You can give me some Japanese stuff, Korean stuff, hip hop, pop, um, <clears throat> soul. You can give me blues, classical, and I I just enjoy it, man. Um, usually, even yeah, just everything. I listen to everything. Country. Was, while you were saying that, I was trying to look it up. There is one 
Japanese band I like. I liked Baby Metal. Baby Metal was awesome. Okay, well, that's probably because they were a little more heard of than others. I think that they're, they're fantastic, obviously, but um, I think that if you had a little more uh, exposure, you'd probably find some others you'd like as well. I'm sure I would. I, I, because I, I like pop music and stuff, so I, I'm sure there's some kind of Japanese pop music that I'd be into. Is there anyone you'd recommend that I should go check out? Because I will go check it out. I listen to a lot of music. Really? Um, yes. So, gosh, yeah, there's quite a few. Um, someone that I really enjoy in terms of if you like pop is uh, Yutada Hikaru. Um, she does a lot of, she, she sometimes sings in English and then also sometimes sings in Japanese, but she's done a lot of music for a series called Kingdom Hearts, which is like a cross between Square Enix's RPGs, but with a Disney twist on it, right? And she's just brilliant vocally. Um, just every time I hear something from her, it just sounds awesome. It can really draw you in. Um, but she's one and, uh, there's some, there's some older songs or, or titles, like, uh, there's a, a singer named Boa, and I'm really bad with, with remembering names, so you have to forgive me for not having a lot for you. Just literally B-O-A, and she was fantastic. There is, uh, a lady by the name of Ayumi Hamasaki, which has done some pop, but also some anime songs, but you'd be surprised how good some of the anime themes can be when, when these artists get on them. It's, it's brilliant, good work. I'm 100% gonna look up all of those, I promise. And I'm gonna let you know what I think of them because <laughs> I, even if it's not something I listen to, so when someone recommends any kind of music to me, uh, I'm all over it. So I will go check that out. Uh, another thing that Mia told me that I thought was funny is, because of the fact that you're a pro wrestler, um, I thought it was funny that you're the shortest guy in your family. That you <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I am the runt. Um, and my youngest brother, who is uh, 15, he, he would be very happy to tell you how short I am um, because <laughs> he's about six foot seven. So um, yeah, my father's six seven. The middle brother, uh, Brandon, is roughly six four six five and then uh the oldest younger brother his name is philip uh he's like right at my height so uh yeah they all either look me in the eye or look down on me and uh forgive my doorbell um <laughs> they're quick to let me know exactly how short i am and they love my face when, when they tell me that so <laughs> It's a joy for them, and uh, I just like to remind them that regardless of how tall they ever get, I am still the strongest, <laughs> and I will still throw them. That's my favorite part about it is because even though they're all taller than you, there's that picture I saw. I, I wasn't looking because it was such a funny, fun fact to me that I was like, well, I got to go find a picture of this, and I was scrolling through your Instagram, and I found the one where it just goes down the line, and you're at the very end of it, but I laughed because it was – as tall as they all are, you could tell that you could still kick all their asses if you, if you had to. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they've tried to, to strong arm me and realize very quickly that I will pick up any of them with one arm with no problem. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, so are they all, is that, is that from diff two different families or is that all one family? So it's all my father's side. Uh, there's a, a few uncles in there, but for the most part, it was just, me, uh, my two youngest brothers, uh, my father, and I think maybe one or two uncles. I think I recall which picture you're talking about, but yeah, just that side of the family. Um, you know, I'm also, my parents were uh, divorced when I was a kid too. And, uh, you know, so it's always hard to like, when people ask that question of like, well, is it your brother, your, you know, half brother? It's like, no, it's just, it's just my sisters, you know, like they're just my, they're just my sisters. I don't classify them as like stepsisters or steps <laughs> or sisters or not, you know? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't tend to follow that trend either. Like it doesn't <laughs> matter as far as I'm concerned. Like they're my blood. That's all that matters. <laughs> when I was watching your your documentary, you know, I I thought it was interesting how you had to kind of like switch between houses when you were a kid, and but you still had, you know, both your parents in your life. Were your parents friendly with each other when they were when you were growing up, or no? 
Um, from the time that I remember, they, they seemed for the most part, yeah. But, uh, you know, the times that I don't remember before then, I, I, I honestly am unaware. Too young to remember is what I would like to quote it as. Yeah, I, I couldn't even imagine my parents being in the same room for a long time. Like, it was such like, a weird thought to me as a, as a kid who has divorced parents. I just, I just couldn't picture them being in the same room together. Yeah, I have, I've had some uh, associates or friends that um, have kind of been in a situation like that. So I've, I've seen it happen and they can uh, feel a little uncomfortable, but uh, I just try to keep them uplifted throughout the scenario and hope for the best. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people who come from divorce end up becoming entertainers in some way. From when I watch and listen to podcasts, I think a lot of people were like, oh, you know, I wanted to make my family happier, so I would entertain them, and then it just kind of transferred over into who I am as a person. And for me, I think it's the same way. Like, I always wanted to make my mom and my dad laugh, and so then I ended up getting into the entertainment business in some way. Interesting. Yeah, I've never really thought about that. Um, I think for me my motivation was really just based around my grandmother when it comes to this uh, beating people up for money situation. But, uh, <laughs> in terms of music, it's just something that I've always, um, I feel I, when I talk to people about music, I, I try to inform them that I feel like it's a, a universal language. That sometimes you don't even have to understand the words to feel the actual song itself. And, so that's something that I've always just loved and kind of gravitated toward personally. I feel like there's not enough wrestling fan grandmas anymore. Like that used to be a thing in the old wrestling shows. You'd always see that one grandma who was in the front row that was a huge fan that was screaming at Hulk Hogan or something. Uh, I feel like that's missing. You don't really see like a grandma in the front row all the time anymore. Yeah, I feel like um, there's less of that and, and more of them uh, just at home because they want to enjoy it with their TVs at home. Um, and, and sometimes it's a, it's a family affair. You know? um, not everybody can always go to the events themselves, but I can tell you personally, um, I've gotten many a message um, from grandparents about um, effects on their younglings, their, their grandchildren and such of what we do and how it's uh, affected their family or helped them or uh, in some cases, maybe uh, talking bad habits, <laughs> uh, such as jumping off of furniture and things of that sort, that we try to say, hey, I'll do that at home. But um, yeah, in general, I think it's a, sometimes it's the family thing, and sometimes it's just the way of change, you know? You never know. Do messages, do messages like that help put things into perspective for you? Because it's like, it's always a grind. You know, you're always from the indies to NXT to now, you're always in this you know, like you're, you're always in a battle of trying to move up and, you know, it's sometimes you can lose focus of what you're doing it for, but when you get messages like that, does it kind of help put things into perspective for you? Um, it, it's something that's very touching, you know, um, for me personally, because of the way wrestling affected my grandmother and, um, uh, would inspire her or lift her up or, make her feel specific things. It's something I always wanted to do for others. And one thing about the idea of being limitless and um, creating this army that I call the Legion is me personally, I want to lift everyone up that way. I want everyone to be inspired, whether it's about sports or um, whatever they're chasing, whatever their goals are, whatever their ambition is. And if they don't have those, then I want to teach people that they can. It doesn't always matter where you're from or, or what your lot has been, what, what cards have been dealt to you in life. If there is enough willpower, then I want to teach them that it's okay to want to be more and to have the drive to do such. So that's a very important and close to home thing for me. That's precisely why I do this show. And that's why I've asked 15 minutes worth of questions. And we haven't even gotten to like a lot of wrestling talk yet is because I do think that people, you know, do take stuff from, from conversations like this. You know, I, I listen to tons of podcasts and hearing, you know, the, the, 
what it's what the person is like behind who we see on TV each week um, helps me feel better about what I'm doing every day and the things that I'm working on and feel more comfortable with with my insecurities. And so um, I agree with you that I'm all about lifting people up and I and and letting people know that like you know sometimes taking risks can lead to big rewards. I agree. And the thing is, <clears throat> sometimes people allow things like fear to rule them, uh, feel of fear of failure, fear of, um, I don't know, maybe not giving it their all or something going wrong or whatever the case may be. And I think that sometimes you just need that voice from the outside to say, hey, regardless of what the chances are, if you don't reach, if you don't take the shot, then there's a 0% chance that you get what you're looking for. Whereas if there's some percentage, there is at least an opportunity to learn and to grow and to be better, to be more. And then if it doesn't work out this time, you just turn around and go do it again. And I think that if anyone's an example, I'm a prime example because let's be honest, guy, I was turned down three times by WWE before they said, hey, we want you. And I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't say, okay, I got I to gotta take this shot, where would I be now? Who knows? It's hard to predict, but here we are and trying to succeed continually, even, even throughout changes, throughout adjustments, throughout whatever hoopla there is, hoops there are to jump through. The key here, no matter what the situation is, is to keep going, keep grinding, keep wanting to be more than you are. And, and my goal, personally, is amongst all the chaos, amongst all of the confusion, the changes, the adjustments, the be this, the be that, is to say, at the end of this, Regardless of what you thought, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to succeed no matter what, because I don't stop. I don't quit. And most importantly, I am limitless. Everyone else can be too. That's all there is to it. I think that's so helpful. I'm definitely going to cut that clip on social media <laughs> because that was like <laughs> something that, that you gave me goosebumps there. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go run through a wall here now. Like, let's go do this. You know, let's finish this interview, you know? <laughs> All right, well, let's, I'll switch to some wrestling talk here. Uh, when did you find out you were sure. being moved from NXT to Raw? Like how soon before? Uh, not, not, not long before, but um, <laughs> it was kind of like... Um, you know, the match was coming up with, with Cross, and it was like, uh, just in passing. Like, it was nothing, just casual. It's like, hey, uh, once this is done, you're, you're going to one of these two places. We don't know yet. And it was like, all right, <laughs> let's, uh, let's make the most of this and, uh, you know, try to, try to have some fun on the way out and cut loose a little bit. How did you feel about leaving NXT? Were you, did you feel like it was time, your, your time was done there? Or did you feel like you could have spent some more time there? Oh, I definitely could have spent more time there. Uh, without a doubt, without question. Um, let's be honest, I, I, I not long won the NXT championship and what, maybe six weeks of, of, of time there before it was like, Shh, you gotta go. But the reality was, as I understand, that the main roster had been wanting to bring me up for a while, and it was really Triple H trying to keep me for as long as he could. And time was just running out, man, at the end of the day. And some things are out of our hands, you know what I mean? So um, it, it, for me personally, I'm always looking for another challenge. So going to the main roster was like, okay, now I get to really see where I stand because as I was concerned, I, I have everything that I need. I think a random no-name guy steps up to Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins in Survivor Series and has the crowd firmly on his side without having something. And in my personal opinion, I have everything. Everything I need, I have it. 
and it's at my disposal. So I don't think that happens. I don't think the situation at Royal Rumble with me and Brock happens. I don't think you hear 42,000 people going nuts for a guy that has nothing, right? The one thing that matters, as far as I'm concerned, is that it doesn't matter what Keith Lee is or who Keith Lee is. What matters is Keith Lee's connection with the people. No matter what happens, anywhere, anytime, those people are going to have something to say. And I will forever be grateful for it. Talent really does dictate where you're going to go, regardless of what they throw, you know, in your direction. And I think that, you know, I've seen what you've been doing so far. I got to see, uh, I was at uh, the Ontario SmackDown. I got to see the dark match that you were in last week at SmackDown. So um, I've seen a little bit of, you know, what you've been doing in the dark matches as well. And I'm excited to see what you're going to be doing on Raw now with this new tweak on your character, because... Uh, I, I I don't know. I like the the serious tone that you're throwing in there, and a little more, a little angrier, a little more vicious. It's it's definitely um, one thing I've had fun with is the fact that it's been probably one of the greatest challenges, um, and it's something that people point out like, ah, you're just naturally nice guy. I want to see the other side. I want to see what happens. And I'm like. You don't want that guy. <laughs> the professional Keith is the best case scenario because the the guy that played football, the guy that has been through a lot in his life is a different being altogether. And they want it, so it's it's a coming. And there's not much that anyone will be able to do about it because when I get to that mindset and I'm so fixated. It's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a, a jet that's hard to stop, you know, trying to stop a jet with a piece of paper. So it'll, it'll be interesting. Like, it kind of feels like from listening to you, you know, cause you said that Bearcat is more like who you were before you discovered uh, your nerd side, I want to say to a certain degree, your, your anime loving, you that's, know, side. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> before you discover that nerd side so it's it's fun it's it's interesting for me to hear that you're like no this new character is the person that i've pushed down for so long and 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 now i'm much more happy and comfortable in in my body as nerd keith lee but it's like they want that that killer to come back at me and that's got to be a weird internal struggle so it is and it's not just because of that being more foreign these days, but it, it touches on things that I've experienced in life, uh, such as uh, like a lot of people really question the way that I speak and my choice of diction, my cadence, my tone, my voice, and how I should narrate and things of that sort. But they don't understand. Before I was a book reader and learned to be who I am, be me, what I feel is me anyhow. The guy that just walked down the street, you can look at me face to face and it makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> it's for, for lack of better terms, if I don't have that approach that makes people comfortable immediately, if you saw me in real life, and you had to bypass me, that makes people part the seat. I'm walking through an airport and I don't have a smile on my face. And I don't speak to you kindly. And I don't, oh, how do you do greetings, salutations, which is my favorite greeting. But if I just look at you, most people, yeah, they don't handle that very well. So when 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 you learn to be different, it's better. So this character is very much that guy that just makes people comfortable. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> you just made me uncomfortable while we were doing this, so it fits, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm sure something that you were happy about right off the jump was the fact that you got to work with guys like Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre on Raw. How cool was that? Um, I will say this. I don't know many people that get to walk into the main roster and immediately work with Randy Orton, but that um, that that was something that I feel like I'm good for the rest of my career. And Randy is someone that has 
kind of become a, a mentor, if you will, and someone that kind of leads the way uh, in, a, in, a, in a great fashion. But the moment that he told me I'm really good at this thing, uh, I didn't care what anybody else thought anymore <laughs> because that's not a person that will compliment you on your abilities if he doesn't mean it. And Randy's not a he will not he will not lie yeah very far from it right <laughs> so for to get his approval is something like I'm good because now I know I'm everything I say I am and I'm good with that well however everything else goes it's fine <laughs> Well, I mean, Randy, I mean, a lot of people say, and I agree with them, that Randy's one of the greatest storytellers in wrestling at the moment right now. So to get that stamp of approval from a guy like him, um, that's got to feel great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I also agree with that with that, uh, that consensus, the fact that he is that, one of the greatest storytellers, honestly, in a long time. The guy gets it and i relate to him on on many levels about that and how um this art that we do is done um thing is now my art's gonna be a little more violent <laughs> <laughs> something i love about randy orton in in his current form is is how quickly he can change stories that are just so vastly different from each other and the audience accepts it you know he can go from this like eight month storyline where he's trying to kill a murder clown to being like a uh, buddy of matt riddle that everybody loves and is like a total baby face and there's no there, no one's going like well he just tried to murder someone on tv like less than a year ago and so i think that speaks to his level of talent uh, that, that he exudes every week on tv not only his talent, but it speaks to his status in this industry, man. The guy, there's a certain level that you reach where your respect is so large that in all honesty, the guy probably could have gotten away with murder with no problem. And, and it would just be like, it's the legend killer. Tonight. That's what he does. So he's a... Uh, He's a guy that's reached uh, that level that kind of transcends typical wrestling, right? He's just a, he's a different dude, and, and that's one thing that I applaud him for is regardless of what's going on, he finds a way to be different. That's something that I value as a lesson that I've gained from from others in the past as well and how important it is to just be unique because how do you stand out without being different? And he will always find a way to stand out. Now, uh, I want to talk about something a little more serious here for a second. Now, you went through a very scary situation regarding your health starting in February, but for anyone watching this or listening to this who maybe isn't aware, are you comfortable talking about what happened at all? Yeah, yeah, man, no, no problem. So I want to talk about, so, so basically you were told that you had, um, you had an inflammation of the heart, correct? Uh, Post-COVID, yeah. So, what, I mean, were you feeling sick at that time or was it just something that that just kind of like that you were just that the doctors found so um uh, i wasn't feeling bad personally um originally there were there were things that was going on that i didn't really understand but i just took them as you know potential because the problem is with this covid thing is no one really knows what's going on, right? It's this uh, trial and error situation and everyone's experiencing different things. And sometimes these after effects hit people differently. Sometimes COVID hits people differently. And some people, it doesn't really hit at all. Um, and in my case, I just assumed I would be fine. Well, okay, well, I tested positive, It'll be a couple of weeks and we'll get back to what we gotta do. And then um, I came back after three weeks um, and then I had that match with Riddle, I believe it was February 8th. Um, and then the next day I got a call saying there was <laughs> something odd in my blood, which kind of gave the, the idea that there was an inflammation and that led to multiple MRIs, uh, and really uncomfortable machines that kind of jammed up this shoulder. But, uh, at, at the time 
yes, I felt some things that were odd, but I didn't understand them to be that. I just assumed because other people were having uh, different scenarios that were odd post COVID that maybe it was going to take me a little longer to, to get back to normal. Right. So I didn't feel abnormal, but there were just some little small things that, that felt odd. And then one MRI passed and it was like, okay, we're going to give it a week or two weeks or whatever. And we'll do another one. And then the second one was worse. And then that is what really led to, Hey man, uh, we need you to not work out. We need you to not do anything uh, until we can figure this out. Um, and then it became very uncomfortable because even though I knew what the potential end game could be, I wasn't telling my family. I wasn't telling me uh, it, that's because it's something that's not in our control. It's something I didn't want them to stress about. Um, so it was kind of a personal battle that I just kind of took on uh, on my own and for the most part stayed quiet about it, regardless of I mean just absurd amounts of messages that I, I, I'm not sure what it is about people thinking that their demands should be met and knowing what's going on in my personal life but me I'm generally a pretty private person uh, so that's a, uh, it took me a long time to be okay with sharing what was going on because it was my own personal fight and I wanted to fight it. Um, and there was nothing more important than fighting it too. And, you know, to this day, I still have some friends over a year later that are suffering from, from effects that, that are post COVID. And I, it's, at the end of the day, I'm just grateful for the fact that I was even able to come back in and be back in the ring because um, that fourth or fifth MRI, when I had to go to Pittsburgh, I was resigned to the fact that my career was done. Uh, I was just ready to be like, okay, well, I guess it's time to pursue some other projects that I have an interest in. And, and then I got some good news. Um, it took a lot of work to come back because when you're a 330, 340-pound athlete, the amount of training and power and explosiveness it takes to be a guy that's 330, 340 and does backflips. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Because it, it, like <laughs> it was like four months you couldn't work out, right? Five. Actually, oh, it was man. six. But five Damn. months of being out of the ring, right? So um, then coming back out of nowhere and just just like five weeks of just dying <laughs> because <laughs> trying to come back was just like, oh, God, how, how have I not trained a thing? And then I come back and just try and do just cardio everything every week, just trying to get back to normal, man. And normal, normal, I don't, I don't know, like, I didn't know what normal was anymore. So it was very strange. But now I can, you know, get back and have higher intensity workouts. So it's it was nice when I could kind of feel like, okay, I'm I'm about where I felt like I should be. Um and, but I still feel like there's work to be done, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, but as as we say, the grind continues and I will keep on keep on grinding. Do you think that this health scare has changed you at all as a person going forward? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, it made me grateful uh, for a lot of things. It made me grateful to be able to come back to work because there are some people that can't. There are some people, uh, not just in this industry, but other fields. There are people that go through this. And not only that, but uh, I lost several people um, to COVID in general, and friends, um, and it's, yeah, it's not a, it's not an easy thing to kind of think about that I could have been one of those people that that was gone. Um, so it's a, a, a very much a reminder of the value of life and the view that is there to just be able to do the things that I do or have the opportunity to do the things that I do. But it also, 
lights a fire under my butt to continue to be that guy that kind of pushes other people along because if we're not trying to be better versions of ourselves, then maybe opportunities are missed. You know what I mean? Yep. So always chasing something new, something better, something great. If it's a healthy thing that we want to do. All right. Well, we've reached the end of the show here, but I'm not going to end it on that note because we got to have a little more positive here at the end a little more a little more happy of a note here at the end i don't want we shouldn't end on that so let's end with my closing questions that i like to call the finishing move first who's your favorite person to hit the big bang catastrophe on and why uh die jack 100 percent uh oh well, i guess what people know him now is t-bar right um yeah or he D- is dominic dijakovic one of the three yeah, take your pick. I will forever and always refer to him as Dijak, so get used to it. <laughs> um, he is he is one of my all-time favorite opponents because uh, not only does he forcefully bring out the monster that is Bearcat, but he brings him out in match fairly quickly because of how hard he hits. But um, we're just reckless together, right? Um I feel like we bring out both the best and the worst out of each other. <laughs> because <laughs> we have just absurd matches that just shouldn't exist by the standards of the big man, right? Yes. But by the same token, we also need to recover for like two weeks or three weeks after fighting each other. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to me, man, he's just he's one of my favorite talents, like period, in terms of the industry. Like the guy's just... He's ridiculous, uh, and I, I respect him so much for the things he can do in the ring, the, the person that he is as a father. He's just, yeah, I love the guy. I love him. I would classify myself as a PWG regular, and I remember the first <laughs> I remember the first time that you guys wrestled against each other there, not knowing really what to expect. There had been some buzz because you guys had had another good match, if I recall correctly, before, you know, a popular match that people were talking about before that. But I remember that first one in Reseda just melting my face off of just like, what am I watching? This is crazy. These two guys are way too big to be doing any of this stuff. This is insane. So um, I'm glad that we got to talk about you and Dijak, at least briefly. Yeah, as we look back on that match, we're like, what What happened? Like, what's going on? And then I still had, what, two or three more matches that night? Yes. <laughs> like, what? In this 120-degree <laughs> building? Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm sad that, that building's good. not there anymore. It doesn't even exist. They fully demolished it. It doesn't even exist. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know. It was so sad. I drove by it once and I was like, oh, the, the worst part is that they didn't even put anything over it yet. So they just, they, it got demolished and there's just like, it's just an empty parking lot now and, it, and they're just oh, filled with memories. Is. I know, dude. It's so sad. All right, we'll move on. Uh, where did the name Big, Big Bang Catastrophe come from? Oh, that's easy, man. So, yeah, matter of fact, I hope, I hope that Chris Savage watches this because he made a video. Uh, and I posted it to my Instagram where he's he's making fun of me because I have gear that is inspired by Broly and I use the spirit bomb. But what he doesn't understand is that I respect Vegeta so much that the Big Bang catastrophe was inspired by the Big Bang attack. I just didn't want to use attack because, I, you know, respect for him so i want to change the word and catastrophe sounds worse i wanted to sound cooler it was a respect move so mr savit i hope that you watch this at some point because i love you my friend i love i love well i love all your characters but vegeta was someone that drew me into the anime world and so yes i'm my my mega finisher is inspired by the big bang attack from vegeta from dragon ball z so yeah and lastly, what's the most memorable time you hit your finisher and why? Oh, easy. Super easy. Um, so one person that, yeah, Adam Cole, the, uh, the great American bash at NXT in our winner takes all match. Uh, not only do I think that Mr. Cole is a brilliant talent um, and 
super capable in the ring. It was really good, like really, really good. But that match was kind of that crowning achievement, the, the thing that kind of shows, yeah, I have what it takes to be the, 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 the person, the one. And that match solidified that. So hitting it on him and, and becoming a double champ was easily the most impactful moment that I've had in my career thus far. So, yeah, that, that was a very special night. Well, Keith, I'm a fan of yours. I'm excited to see you clawing your way through Monday Night Raw every week now. Uh, thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. I'll see you soon right after I claw my way to some food. <laughs> Have a good one. Take care, bud. <laughs> that was Keith Bearcat Lee. Make sure you watch him every week on Monday Night Raw. But also, also, make sure that you subscribe to Out of Character on whatever podcast platform you listen to on, whether it be Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever, make sure you're subscribed to this show on there. And if they let you leave a rating or review, it helps. So please do that. It, it really does help me out and I read them and it makes me happy. So please go rate and review the show if you can. Also make sure that you subscribe to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel. That's where you can find clips of Raw, SmackDown, NXT 2.0, and this show, the full show, clips, all of it. You can catch it all there on the WWE on Fox YouTube channel. Also, follow WWE on Fox on all social media platforms as well. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Officially tapping out for now. Until next time, I'm Ryan Satin, and this is Out of Character.